Good morning. My name's Adam, if we haven't had a chance to meet. Um, we started last week, and we are continuing today talking about transformation. We're looking at a handful of transformers, and we're finding that more, there is more than meets the eye. Yeah, thank you. I knew at least one. Oh, my gosh. Even if it's only one, that's enough to feed me. Thank you. I was really actually kind of concerned that that would just fall like most of them do. And so now at least it shows that we're moving in the right direction together. So, oh my gosh. You guys put up with a lot. Last week we watched Nicodemus transformed out of religion in, uh, in the Gospel of John. This week... An unnamed woman is going to be transformed out of brokenness. And, and she's transformed to a role that, that makes her known to every Christian church in the history of the world. This woman is known literally by every Christian church in the history of the world. But our starting place today is the same as the starting place that we had with uh, the beginning of the year when we had our Start Strong series. We had that common thread that we've been looking for, that we've identified, that is the place that we have to start when we look at stories like this. It cuts to the very core uh, of what, what is the battleground for salvation, and also it's the target of the enemy's most effective weapon against us. It's the lies about identity. So when we talk about brokenness, which is what the woman at the well is transformed out of, we're talking about identity. We're talking about the tangled web of truth and lies that, that forms the way that we see ourselves and the way that we present ourselves to others. The truth in this comes as far as it relates to brokenness because the things that break us are real, right? The things that, that break us are real, they really happened. That stuff actually occurred. We actually did them. They actually happened to us. That stuff is real, and therefore it is in the realm of truth. But also lies, because the enemy wants us to define our identity by the things that have happened and the things that we've done. Henry Nouwen teaches that there are several lies that, that inform our identity, the way that we look at ourselves. And those lies are what we do defines us. Or what we have done defines us. What we've experienced from someone else defines us. What people say about us, often in relation to those things, define our identity. And then finally, what we say about ourselves all becomes lies that inform our identity. Now, I spend a lot of time providing pastoral care around this idea of, of moral injury. And Moral injury is, is sort of a, a, the spiritual uh, companion to PTSD, but it's also not necessarily based in, in a traumatic event. Moral injury, uh, I like this. This is uh, William Nash, Dr. William Nash, who was the, the former psychiatrist for the 1st Marine Division. That's, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine having that job, being the psychiatrist <laughs> for, for Marines? That's interesting. But he defined moral injury this way. He says that moral injury is a syndrome of shame, self-handicapping, anger, and demoralization that occurs when deeply held beliefs and expectations about moral and ethical conduct are transgressed. Dr. Nash says that, that it is distinct from, from a life threat or like a trauma insofar as it's also not inherently fear-based. It can arise from killing, perpetration of violence, betrayals of trust, witnessing depraved behavior, or failing to prevent serious unethical acts. Sounds a lot like sin. Moral injury really is the erosive, the erosive diminishment of our souls. And it is that because our moral actions and the actions of others against us have harmful outcomes. It rises from our attempts to do the right thing as individuals and as communities 
and our desire to have done the right thing, it comes from our desire to not be bad and realizing that sometimes we really are. Dr. Carrie Haynes, who's a, a mental health chaplain at the San Antonio VA clinic, suggests that moral injury can come by way of betrayal of what is right by someone who holds legitimate authority, which also then opens up the door of what moral injury can actually be, be caused from to the, the actions of others on us. Abuse. These things can cause moral injury. And really, now we can see that moral injury and brokenness can be used interchangeably. This is, rele this is relevant to our examination of life, life transformed today because moral injury feeds the lies of identity. What we have done or what has been done to us becomes how we define ourselves. What others say about us in relation to our moral injury feeds that definition. And finally, that de definition becomes something that the broken person agrees with spiritually. And they can no longer think of themselves as the beloved of the Almighty God. The problem with that crossing that line is that the knowledge that God doesn't make trash cannot permeate minds and hearts. When we allow our moral failings and our brokenness to define our identity, we forget this from Matthew chapter 3. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. And if you remember how we talked about this at the beginning of the year, it makes sense to me that God the Father could say this about his own Son. It makes sense to me that he could say it about Jesus. The difficulty is knowing that he says that about me. Hebrews 2.11. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. And that word that is used for brothers and sisters is a physical re uh, relationship that we could better understand as blood relative. We're blood relatives with Jesus when Jesus comes out of the water and is told, and, and the, the Holy Spirit descends on him and the Father's voice says, this is my beloved child. Yes, he was talking about Jesus. But he also looks at you and says, there is my beloved child. And they bring me such joy. And I think about the contrast between what God says about me and how I think back about my life and in words that define who I am. Murderer. Liar. How much easier is it to take those words and build an identity on those rather than the truth that you are the beloved of Jesus? That has to be our starting place when we talk about brokenness. If that means that God doesn't make trash, there's no condition placed on what, Je what is said about Jesus, what's said about us. God didn't wait until you were no longer a dirty sinner to say, you're my beloved. And you bring me great joy. He said that in I mean, in the commission of my sins, right? He says that about me and said that about me at my worst. As I am right now. That is my child. My dearly loved child. That child brings me great joy. 
Now, when we think about the, the woman that we're going to consider today, think about the conversation God must have had about you, the same type of conversation that God had about this woman, the same conversation, the triune God talking about you in the same way he talks about the focus of our study today. There's a vineyard curriculum that, that I read that, that imagines the conversation to go like this. God the Father points to her and says, son, it's her time. Jesus responds, we have waited so long for this moment. And then the Holy Spirit adds, her heart is ready and prepared. She'll still have a choice as to what to do when she meets you. But she is soft from all the pain she carries, rather than being as hard as many would expect. And we know often hardness is a mask. So we're going to see that mask break off as we meet the woman at the well. So let's pray. Father, would you release the gifts of your spirit with us now? I pray, Father, for all that, that resonate with the definition of moral injury, would you meet them now? I pray, Father, that you would be present in their heart. Would you rest your hand on that, in, that injury? Father, would you also pull us from the lies of identity? Would you break the lies in the name of Jesus? Would you freeze the tongue of the liar in the name of Jesus? And Father, would we hear the conversation that you have had about us? It's our time. And we know you've waited so long. So meet us, Lord. Meet us in our brokenness, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on his way. Eventually, he came to a, Samari a Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat warily beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised. For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now we know that the historical animosity runs deep. 600 years of, of animosity that really is uh, probably another sermon, you know, for, from what we are talking about today. But this is, it goes deeper than what we would know as racism. This was was blood feud. And that blood feud was so deep that, that it was just, you, a Jew would not, to the extent that even to avoid walking through Samaria, they would walk to the other side of the Jordan River and walk all the way around and add even days to their journey just because they don't want their feet to be in the dust that's owned by a Samaritan. This is not like minor issues. And it comes from some things that happened um, it, during the, the, the diaspora when, um, when both the northern and the southern kingdom were conquered, which happened centuries upon centuries before this moment. This is uh, a historical animosity that, um, that defines, one, the Samaritan identity in the Jewish mind. Samaritans are dirty. They're also cowards. You can't trust them, and you certainly don't want to touch them. Maybe a good way to describe that is they're not human. Because of that, what we have to keep in mind is the brokenness that we're talking about today, this brokenness is more than just the brokenness of an individual. This is cultural brokenness that is going to be addressed today. A community brokenness that runs deep 
into the political and the religious history of the people that we're dealing with. Her brokenness, coupled with the broken attitudes toward her culture, makes her unworthy of this moment by worldly standards. She should not be in the presence of the Messiah for the nation of Israel. She is unworthy of the moment. To everybody but the one who actually matters in terms of opinion. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. This well's very deep. Where would you get this living water? I love that so much because it's, it's a deflection as much as it is just pointing out like w- what's actually going on. It's a deflection because she doesn't have to engage with this nut job that's sitting there talking about living water when we're at the well. She can just say, you don't even have a bucket. What do you, just stop. Now, a quick side note that just like, I can't not tell you this because I just love this stuff so much, but did you know that in 1935, Very near this spot, archaeologists found a well. Almost like, I mean, you could like read the description in in scripture in Genesis, and and they they found a well in this place, and it was 138 feet deep, much deeper than wells, uh, than other wells in the area. Does that do anything for our story today? No, but I think it's cool. (laughs) 1935. They found this deep well that Jesus did not have a rope or a bucket for. (sighs) And besides, do you think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Oh my gosh, you can see the brokenness of that statement. She is, she's missing what he's saying, but she's applying it to her context. Don't make me do this walk of shame anymore. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. This is the heart of her brokenness. But more than meets the eye, right, this is not behavioral brokenness. See, this woman has a history. We can discern what type of history based on her actions and by what Jesus reveals. First, she's coming to get water in the heat of the day. If you've ever been in the Middle East, like, there's no good, like, noon is not a good time to do anything. It is, and it's also, like, like noon to, like, the next noon and every noon after. Like, <laughs> it's, yeah, I, oh, Hot. It's hot. And this is another thing, too. You may not be aware of this, but water is heavy. Water is heavy. That's, carrying water is dumb. Whoever invented pipes, praise God. Water is heavy, and hot is bad. When it's hot and things are heavy, that's like the worst. That, and, and she is making this choice every day. In the heat of the day, to carry heavy things. This well is not close to the town. During the heat of the day, you would do as little as possible, and culturally that still remains, that this is not the time for work. And so when normally, when the the women of the town and the surrounding communities would go to get water, would be early when it's cool, or after the sun, you know, like in that nautical twilight time, where, there's, where the heat is kind of still in the ground but not in the air. You're going when it makes sense to move. That's when the, the, there probably would be a line. 
at this well. And also, this is the place where community would happen. You would talk to people. You would probably gossip because that's what people do, right? You would, like, you would, you would see people. You would meet people. You would make plans. You, this was a community endeavor. These women had like a micro community around the well of when they would go. It's kind of like the modern day barbershop, or at least it used to be back when you'd go to the barbershop at the same time and hang out with the same people and, and talk about the same stuff. Like this is where community happened. And she avoided community. She's getting water when community outcasts get water. Her brokenness has changed her behavior and she has become isolated. This is a common feature of moral injury and brokenness. Isolation from community because of the lies that enter in and form our identity about what people say about us. If you ever lived in a small town, you know how this works. The town knew her reputation. They knew her behavior. Not only is, is she shacking up with the dude that she's with right now, but she, she had five marriages before this. Culture and gossip would call her promiscuous or something much more profane. Jesus sees beyond the behavior of her brokenness. He sees the root that causes it. He sees a girl desperate to be cared for. Desperate to be secure. Because security, especially at this point in history, security is tied to marriage. Being without a husband is to be poor and also defenseless. This girl is scared. She's afraid of being alone. She's afraid of insecurity And to answer that fear, she uses her body to try and stay safe. She isn't a whore. She's terrified. She's also ashamed. She's, a, she's ashamed because she knows the way she's going about gaining provision isn't accepted. It's wrong. She's ashamed, just like we are, when we know we are outside of the boundaries of what is right. She can feel herself outside of the boundaries, and her actions demonstrate this. Now, there's another interesting piece to the story that I, I've missed for, for years reading Scripture. I never saw this before. We know that, that we're talking about a real, a real person today. We know she really existed. We know that she had a mother and a father. She had a family line, but we don't know what that line is, save this. She's a Samaritan. She calls Jacob her ancestor. Now, Jacob, a patriarch, a founding father of the nation of Israel, the one that actually earned the name Israel after wrestling with God, because the name means wrestling with God, which we know is a very apt description of the nation of Israel before the Messiah. This land where the well is makes a really interesting part of the story today. Genesis thirty-three eighteen through 20 says, Jacob arrived safely at the town of Shechem in the land of Canaan. There he set up camp outside the town. Jacob bought a plot of land where he camped from the family of of Hamor, the father of Shechem. He bought it for 100 pieces of silver. And there he built an altar. And in this place, this would be a place where the well would be built in the future. But after this, if you read beyond what happens in the story, the prince of Shechem, the son of Hamor, he sees one of Jacob's daughters. Dinah. He gets overtaken with lust and he rapes her. And then after raping her, he asks his father to, to try to make that, that right and also he wants to, to marry her. And so Hamor goes to Jacob and has a really uncomfortable conversation. My son raped your daughter and now he wants to marry her. So how can we make that happen? 
pretty disgusting conversation. And Jacob, um, Jacob has some decisions to make, right? Jacob then, his sons find out what happened to their sister, and they're ready to go to war over this. They're, they want to pay back that wrong by making war. And so they trick Hamor and the people of Shechem. And they pretend to agree to a wedding. They pre- pretend to agree to this. And they say, well, this is the problem, though. Like, we're just, we're different religions. So what you need to do is, is you and all your men need to become circumcised. And then we can have this wedding. So go get circumcised. And then we'll party. And so they agree. Like, what a, like, okay, if that's all we have to do to cover this up and to, to move, like, this is good. We'll go do this. And they all went and got circumcised. And as they are weak from blood loss and still sore, where soreness doesn't make fighting something that you really want to do, Jacob's sons blow through the town and just kill everybody. That is the legacy of the land where the well is. It's also the ancestral line of the woman at the well. This event added to the reality that Jacob lived a life of deceit and dishonesty. But in the end, he realized the grace of God is further added to the fact that this land would be given to Joseph who also realized the grace of God after having an insane amount of pride and getting humiliated by his brothers. He found himself enslaved by that pride before he discovered the grace of God. This is the ancestral line of the woman at the well. Now, we know Man, this is just like, like heaped upon heaped of brokenness, cultural brokenness, uh, an ancestral line brokenness, behavioral brokenness of a woman trying to protect herself. Jesus is in the transformation business. Like her ancestors, she's about to discover grace. Did you notice that Jesus did not call her out of her behavior? We ought to take note of that. He did not call her out of behavior. He led her to self-awareness. You've heard me say it before. Sin is relational, not behavioral. It leads to behavior that demonstrates the brokenness in our hearts. Sin is about replacing God as the center of our order. The woman at the well replaced God with relationships in order to be secure. Her security came from men rather than from God. This is the well that she's been drinking from. Does she get security from drinking at that well? Kind of. Are her needs met? Ish. But to maintain her existence, she has to keep going back to that well again and again and again. And that which is sustaining her life is also ending her life. It's taking her life. As she gets farther and farther away from community, and the root of brokenness grows deeper and deeper, choking out her ability to see herself as the beloved of God. So what does Jesus offer her? Living water. This isn't just a drink. It's a spring that provides constantly. The water from Jacob's well would satisfy the woman's thirst for a time. Which is true of all the other drinks of life. But don't completely satisfy. 
create more thirst. Needs for love, food, sex, security, need for approval. Drinking at those fountains do not give complete satisfaction. And our attempts to find full satisfaction in things that are not of God, that are not of the Holy Spirit, will lead only to disappointment, despair, brokenness, isolation. The water Jesus gives covers need and desire because it provides what brokenness truly longs for. Brokenness truly longs for the presence of the Father offering grace, forgiveness, and rescue. The drink that brokenness needs, the drink that covers brokenness, is to hear the voice of God say, there is my child. I love my child so much. I'm so pleased with my child. It brings me such joy. This water becomes more than a drink as we accept our position as a child of God, as his beloved, because God's presence becomes a perpetual spring within us giving us eternal life. This inner spring contrasts with the water from the well, which required hard work to acquire in the heat of the day. As Nicodemus learned in John 3, this spring is a reality for those that are born anew in the Spirit. Those that come to Jesus broken, And accept the gift of living water. Brokenness is the the thirst that cannot be quenched. But Jesus, the living water, transforms us out of brokenness. And we never thirst again. Let's worship.